So the story is that I met with Google, uh, I think over a month ago, I was in London and uh, originally we were going to meet in Ireland, but they said, hey, come to our London office. And I said, all right. So I went there and it was an informal uh, Q&A session. So basically they said, uh, hey, uh, we'd like to ask you lots of questions about the cryptocurrency space, about the technology that Cardano uh, has and uh, what IOHK does as a company. And I said, all right, well, you can ask me whatever you guys want. That's fun. Uh, and uh, let's hope that uh, we come to some sort of good conclusion. Uh, so we were there for about two hours, uh, give or take, uh, and uh, we produced a transcript of the questions that were asked. And then there was kind of a nice tour that they gave us of the building. And the London Google office was really pretty. We really enjoyed it. And uh, we went about our way. Uh, so we asked Google if they would mind us uh, creating a transcript of the meeting and then posting it. They said no, because transcripts take time to produce. Uh, we, uh, we spent about a month on it, and we released it. As soon as we released it, we ended up getting an overwhelmingly large response, uh, mostly with people insinuating that there's soon some sort of partnership with Google on the way. Um, here's the reality. Google is a multinational company. Uh, it's one of the largest, most powerful engineering companies in the world. They have some phenomenal scientists working at Google from world famous cryptographers to InfoSec people. Uh, if Google is going to do a cryptocurrency, Google does not need to partner with me. And they don't need to partner with Ethereum or Bitcoin or anything else. Uh, they're just going to go ahead and do their own thing. That said, Google is a good patron of open source technology. And many of their employees do invest uh, their weekends and at least one day a week on contributing to some open source project. And Google does have a very large internal cryptocurrency and blockchain mailing list. And a lot of their employees love this space. In fact, um, Mike Hearn is one of the most famous Googlers to work. He was originally a core developer of Bitcoin. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of interest in the company there. So we felt it'd be an excellent opportunity to tell them what we're working on. And if any of their employees or if affiliates want to make open source contributions, we'd always welcome it. But I uh, don't think there's going to be a partnership anytime soon with Google. I think Google, like Microsoft and Apple and Facebook, is just going to go its own way and do its own thing at the high level. Uh, but there always are opportunities for us to collaborate. Uh, and if uh, Google has some ideas or we have some ideas that we think make sense, uh, then we'll, of course, pursue that. We are using Google technology in our stack. Uh, Electron is actually a fork of Chromium and Node stitched together, and that's the heart of Daedalus. And there's a lot of other little things that Google's worked on in the past that we've pulled into our tech stack because they're just legitimately really good ideas. And we hope that Google can see parts of our stack as useful to things that they work on. So that's the Google question. OK, let's take a look at these uh, questions we have here. Oh, this one's interesting. What is your relationship with Cardano uh, Communications, your relationship with Michael Parsons? So that looks like a fun question to ask. Um, so the Cardano Foundation, Emergo, and IOHK are three, kind of the three core entities at the moment behind Cardano. Cardano, from the very beginning, was federated. It wasn't like in the beginning there was a person, then a company, then a collection of companies. In the beginning, there was a collection of companies. And uh, each and every one of them serves a different role and purpose in the ecosystem. So IOHK builds the protocol. It's our job to figure out, at least for the initial impulse, what is the core collections of technologies necessary for a really good cryptocurrency that the community can then take and augment, meaning that there are governance tools built in and there's funding tools built in so the community will have the resources necessary to execute on the next roadmap post our involvement. Uh, but then there, of course, needs to be an entity that's kind of the evangelist and it goes around and says, you should build on Cardano. You should use Cardano in your stack. Cardano is the most amazing thing in the whole world. And that entity is Emergo. They're kind of like our version of Consensus. Consensus is tremendously successful for the Ethereum ecosystem, and they've done just amazing work uh, for Ethereum. And our hope was that could there be a consensus for Cardano. And that's what Emergo does, amongst other things. But then there actually needs to be that objective, neutral party that tends to keep everybody honest and make sure that the claims that are being made and things that are being done are re reasonable. Furthermore, if there are obvious attempts to scam people, like fake wallets um, or blatantly dishonest statements which are intended to hurt people or steal their money, there needs to be somebody who has the mandate to go out there and fight those people and get things where they need to go. So the foundation is both a community management, uh, kind of a golden source of information, and it also serves as an auditor. For example, they've retained FP Complete to look at our code and verify that we're actually doing our job properly. 
Um, they also collaborate on things like the enterprise Cardano ideas and what is the enterprise Cardano strategy. So when we want to extend Cardano beyond just a cryptocurrency and a decentralized ledger and go into the permission blockchain space, what does that need to look like and how do we need to make that work? And they also hold the trademarks for Cardano. So the relationship with Parsons and the relationship with the foundation is exactly what you would expect. Uh, we are our friends. We work hard together and we're serving a common goal. But at the end of the day, we are our own people. So I have my own work and he has his own work. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we agree. Sometimes we disagree. Uh, but for the most part, we've gotten along really well over the years. And uh, we have a very productive relationship. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Uh, let's see here. Are any ZK snarks coming to Cardano Ada about SPV nodes? So snark technology is, is really interesting. So succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge, this whole notion of zero knowledge. So the point of zero knowledge is to say, okay, I know something and you want to know that thing that, or at the very least, you want to know something about that thing. Like, for example, uh, I can claim I'm, over a certain age, over 18, or I can claim that I know the password to get access to a file, for example. Now, the problem is that when I share that information with you, you gain knowledge in that if I share the password to get access to a file, you now also have access to the file. So anything that makes me special is now no longer special. Uh, so the point of zero knowledge is to verify to a person who's asking that you indeed do know something like the password to decrypt that file, but not actually give them that asset. So it's a very powerful primitive. It's something that was originally discovered in the 1980s by people at MIT, Sylvia McCauley and others. So where zero knowledge is really interesting is it can be used in the cryptocurrency context to give us either what it's called verified computation or private transactions. So in the case of verified computation, what that's about is that's about saying, hey, you have a program and I'm going to give you an input for that program. And I want you to give me an output. So let's say I want you to fold a protein. So you're going to do all these manipulations and then the output would be the folded protein. Okay. And I told you how to fold it. That was the input. Well, here's the problem. How do you know that I've actually done that computation correctly? This is a broader problem in outsourceable computation. So the solution for Ethereum is by replication. So it's how math used to be done back in the day, where uh, before computers, you'd have a bunch of people inside a room, usually they were women, uh, and they would give them math problems to solve, and they would solve it. And you'd go and say, what's, for example, 5 plus 11 is a simple example. And if there was 11 people in the room, if you know six of them raised their hand and said 11, uh, you know, they, they would say, okay, that's the answer. We're going to go with it. And that's basically how Ethereum works. You have a collection of shared computation, these nodes will do it. And uh, if you have a majority answer, that's the answer. Well, the problem is that doesn't scale um, and because as you add more nodes to do the computation, you're getting more assurance that the computation has been done correctly, but you're not actually speeding the computation up. You're as slow as the slowest person. So there's been a lot of talk about, could we use NARC technology or zero knowledge technology to say, okay, I'm gonna give you this basket of computation to do you're going to go ahead and run that computation and then give me an output, let's say a smart contract, and you're going to give me an output like a random number generated from it or something like that. But I need to know it's been done correctly. So what if I can give you a proof of correctness alongside that? And looking at that, you don't have to rerun the computation. You just know the computation has actually been done correctly. There's actually some research that's out of Microsoft for a framework called Pinocchio that studies these things. And um, basically the answer is not only can you do this, uh, the proofs are constant size. They're about 288 bytes. They're really hard to make, but they're constant in terms of their size and easy to validate. So that's one avenue where ZK is really interesting. Another avenue is for privacy. That's what Zcash is about. And that's what uh, Zencash is about in these types of projects. And we think a lot, excuse me, we think a lot about ah, sore throat. We think a lot about how uh, we can use SNARK technology to allow us to have more anonymous transactions, but also things like side chains. So the very same primitives that allow you to have private transactions and verified computation could potentially be used to verify properties of a blockchain where you don't have the underlying blockchain. So for example, let's say that you receive a side chain transaction. So something from Bitcoin to Litecoin. 
So when it goes from Bitcoin to Litecoin. So if you're in Litecoin, those nodes need to know two things, two characteristics about that particular transaction. One, they need to know that the tokens that you're sending over exist. So there's an existential question. Are, is this real Litecoin or Bitcoin that you're sending over to Litecoin, for example? Second, they need to understand that you haven't double spent those tokens. So how do we know that you've taken legitimate Bitcoin and you haven't also sent it to Dash or you've sent it to Ethereum or something like that? So there is an existential question and then there is a non-existential question, a non-existence of uh, a double transaction. So it turns out that you potentially could build a proof using zero knowledge technology that has a nice constant size and it's easy to validate that could answer both of those questions. And the validators of that proof would not necessarily need to have a copy of the entire other blockchain to validate that. So these are kind of a spectrum of things. Now, in terms of uh, IOHK, what are we doing in res respect to ZK and Cardano? So uh, we have a collection of research streams that we're working on. One is the verified computation side of things. We have a million dollar lab that we've set up at University of Edinburgh led by Markov Kohlweis. He originally was from Microsoft Research and he left and became a professor up in Edinburgh. And basically they're examining um, how do we use zero knowledge to get ourselves more private and more verifiable computations. We're looking at pulling this technology into our sidechains protocol to make it more efficient. And we're also looking at this technology for private off-chain smart contracts. So uh, we have a collection of different people from Dionysus Zindros to Markov to uh, Thomas Gilber and others who are working on that. And uh, at some point we'll publish a paper, but this research is pretty complicated. These uh, things are pretty difficult to build and there's not many people who do them well. So it takes a bit of time to spool things up, but it's an area of inquiry that we think is uh, quite promising. And there's certainly a lot of work at a lot of different. Mm -hmm. yep, but, um... Now that Ethereum Classic has a good foothold, will IOHK continue to support ETC development? Um, and that's a good question. So, uh, you know, when if ETC first came out, uh, you know, I wanted to prove a point that it, it is immoral uh, when you advertise something for an ICO to then turn tail and completely do the opposite because of legal inconvenience. You know, if you say, hey, code is law, we're going to invent words, and we're going to say you can't change the ledger just because it turns out that maybe you weren't ready to commit to that. Uh, you can't just suddenly pretend like you didn't make that promise. You know, if I sell you a product, you give me money, I can't retroactively come back and say, you know, I'm going to change the terms and conditions of that transaction because I just found out it's inconvenient to me. You know, sorry, if you sold something, you have to deal with the consequences of the thing you sold. So when I got involved in Ethereum Classic, if anything, it was to prove that uh, principles matter and that it, it's not okay to reverse and that people need to have the option. If people believe in what Vitalik has done, they can keep with Ethereum. If they believe that the original intent should be maintained, they can sell their Ether and stay within the Ethereum Classic ecosystem. And basically people were given a proper choice, not a rushed choice. Now, one of the problems is that the Ethereum Classic community in the beginning had no credibility, A, because the majority of the infrastructure developers went over to Ethereum. So the Rust guys, the Geth guys, these people, uh, they lived in the Ethereum side, and there was nothing going on in the Ethereum Classic side that would indicate that Ethereum Classic actually had a competency that you would expect of someone who could not only maintain the chain, but also upgrade the chain and grow the chain. So we felt it was very important for us to invest money into building from the ground up, a completely new client from nothing. So we just took the yellow paper, the documentation, we borrowed no code, we brought together a great team of Scala developers, we called them the Growth Indeed team, and uh, we said, go have fun. And they spent basically a year constructing, at the moment, the most concise Ethereum client ever built. It's only about 12,000 lines of code, it's got beautiful test coverage, it's been security audited, it's fast, it's easy to use. Uh, it has the Daedalus front end, and we're going to make a lot of improvements to make that even better and bring in native ERC-20 support so you can hold your ERC-20 tokens in, in addition to Ether Classic. And, and we just went and did that. So now we're at a point where Mantis is not only out, it's gone through a major update, and it's going to go through an even another major update. And we have to kind of make a decision of where will IWHK go with Ether Classic? And there's a lot of challenges. Um, there are governance challenges and that it doesn't have a leader. There's a very decentralized group of people, uh, kind of like Bitcoin, who are doing different things. And each and every one of them kind of has a vision and a different idea. 
Also, like Bitcoin, there's no centralized source of funding. There's no one who has this like ICO pool of money or pre-mine who then gets to decide who gets funded, even if they're beneficent and give you grants, there's still no one there. So there has been some attempts to create some capital aggregation, uh, but we haven't quite seen that materialize in a way that would be productive for everybody yet, but it doesn't say it's not going to happen. So we're going to have a summit in September, and I'll be attending and presenting and we're going to be showing off our latest version of Mantis, where we have built in Ethereum support. So now Mantis targets both Ethereum Classic, Ethereum, and it's an ERC-20 wallet. So you can basically have a God's eye view of all those asset types. And it'll have a few other things built under the hood that are very nice. And because this is a full node, you can actually technically run the entire Ethereum network or the entire Ethereum Classic network just off of that code base. Then we'll discuss at the summit with the other people, what should 2019 look like? And does it make sense to scale up effort, keep the effort at the same level, or gradually scale down effort and you know, let the community manage that, uh, that node that we've written? But I think it's overall mission accomplished. Uh, most people respect Ethereum Classic at this point, if anything, uh, just for its principles. Uh, most of the fights of the past have been resolved, and even Vitalik himself actually still holds some Ether Classic. And a lot of people in the Ethereum ecosystem, turns out, never sold their Ether Classic. They kept it. It's a small coin, uh, but it's probably going to stay on proof of work. And it is a good opportunity to start having discussions about whether you can still do innovation with proof of work in the smart contract space. And if it stays in that direction, it doesn't compete directly with Cardano. So I see no issue with having that discussion. So, uh, so that's basically where we're at right now. Um, the growth and te team did a tremendous job. The other thing is they did a very transparent job. So if you actually go to our YouTube channel and go to the IWHK uh, channel and you look at the growth and Deke meetings, you can start from March of last year and like clockwork every single week, watch a 10 to 20 minute meeting of the developers getting together and talking about what they accomplished that week. And that's been public for almost more than a year now. Uh, so you could see the development evolution of the client from scratch and how it went from an idea to actual software deployed that's been audited and very high quality with good test coverage. And so I'm, I'm really proud of that level of transparency. And I'm really proud that we were able to build that. And to date, I think it's the only functional version of um, Ethereum written in a uh, version of Ethereum written in a functional language. So that's a story there. Okay. Let's see here. Do you original needs to, how many languages will Cardano support and smart contracts and dApps be written in? And let's see, get some other questions. Ah, okay, so there's some good questions here. All right, um, so Cardano has been misrepresented a lot, and it's it's amazing. You know, I, I guess I'm failing at comps and marketing, but I, I hear things from we're an ERC-20 token to the only way to write smart contracts is in Haskell um, at the moment. There is no way to write Haskell smart contracts with Cardano. So I don't know where that came from, but okay. Uh, the goal of Cardano is to be both principled and pragmatic. So there are kind of three collections of problems you have to solve when you think about computation. There's computation around well-understood domains. And the most pertinent domain to the cryptocurrency space is computation around accounting. So that's what Bitcoin solves. And most cryptocurrencies based in that paradigm where they say, I have an asset and I need to figure out who owns it. And I need to have a large catalog of bespoke type transactions that allow me to move that asset between people. That can be contingent settlement style transactions like multi-sig, for example. Uh, and that can be arbitrarily complicated things that are like event based transactions or things like that. So there's a whole basket of that stuff there. And Bitcoin only covers a small sliver of it. And that's one of the original biggest frustrations that I had and other people had with Bitcoin was that it only covered a sliver of this beautiful, rich financial ecosystem. You say, all right, well, why don't we build an accounting ledger that allows you to represent the types of assets and those types of transactions in the most efficient way and paralyzable way possible. So you can get visa scale long-term performance but then you can also do everything that Wall Street is used to doing. So we created a domain specific language called Marlowe. We created a general purpose programming language that was functional that Marlowe embeds in called Plutus. And we really rigorously thought about the UTXO accounting model. And we also came up with a way to issue assets within that model that's interoperable with the Ethereum style account model. Okay, so that's one basket. And we're gonna put a huge amount and we're actually already putting a huge amount of money and effort and resources into 
getting that where it needs to go. That team has grown from two people to six people, and it'll soon grow to eight. Uh, and we're getting to the point where we're starting to run thought experiments about different types of exotic transactions and other things and making sure that all our security assumptions are great. So that's awesome. And that's going to kind of finish what Bitcoin started. Then you have the Ethereum style computational model, which is replicated or some notion of distributed computation. But what do these are? Stateful programs. You send messages to them. They wake up, they do something, they output something, and you can chain them together. And there's all kinds of crazy things you can do. So if you want to build a DAO or you want to build a ride sharing application or these types of things, uh, you can have these types of programs. Now, uh, Ethereum kind of brought this model to the forefront cool model, interesting model. Uh, the problem is that model at the moment does not scale. And anybody who's actually using that model for anything that's more than a toy has had to interface that with off-chain activity. You know, So uh, basically, they've either had to leave Ethereum or they've had to kind of build a two-layer network where the blockchain does a little something, and then there's some server off in the distance that does something else. That's OK, uh, because it's prototype technology. It's you know not, not so capable in the beginning. So uh, we have a bunch of threads of research that we're doing about how do we make that model better? So first, how do we pull some of that computation off the chain and allow you still to do it in the same type of trust model or similar trust guarantees than you have as if it was replicated? So that's things like what Markov is doing with SNARK technology. And we're also looking to things like state channels and so forth. And there's a lot of different pathways you can go. Second, you have to make sure that when you do do things on this slow engine, that they're done as securely as possible and most reliably as possible with the most interoperability as possible. So that's why we engage runtime verification. We said, first, spend a lot of time and effort understanding Ethereum. So they wrote the KEVM paper and wrote formal semantics for that, but then also built something completely new that is built from the ground up to be really the best foundation for a virtual machine for smart contracts in this model. So they created Yella. And Yella was based on LLVM, which is a very successful framework. Uh, Apple funded it. Steve Jobs himself really liked it. The, the department chair of University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign is the one who built it with a few others. So uh, we think that that's something very awesome and, and it really can provide a lot of power. Now, if Yella alone would be cool, and it's pretty easy to write compilers for Yella because it's like targeting LLVM, and uh, that's very well understood at the moment by language designers. That said, we need interoperability as well. And so we've invested a lot of money uh, through runtime verification in this concept called semantics-based compilation. It's complicated, but basically the concept is if you take a language and you write that language in a very special way, you pay that cost one time, then what happens is you can then take a program written in that language and translate it into another program written in another language that's also been written in that very careful way. So if you have k-semantics for one language and k-semantics for another, you can do some notion of a translation between the two. So uh, we're right now running experiments. Uh, RV is running experiments with semantics-based compilation. And uh, throughout the summer, we're going to see if that high-risk, high-return effort is successful. If it is, then what we've done is basically built a universal compilation target. And all we have to do to support a new language is just write the semantics of that language down. And we can even make this a community-driven effort where you can create a special transaction where you can write the semantics for your programming language, whether it be a real complicated language like C++ or a toy language you've created for a domain-specific application. You write those, you register those. And then if they're on the blockchain, a compiler a special type of compiler can see them there and then would understand how to interpret that program and translate it to run as a smart contract in our system. Uh, so it's a pretty wonky, crazy idea. There are other concepts uh, that people have been pursuing with this uh, notion of a universal foundation like crawl from Oracle and so forth. Uh, but we think semantics-based compilation could be a long arc project that eventually gives us damn near universal interoperability meaning that we can eventually support hundreds, if not thousands, of programming languages to target our system. Now, uh, the really cool thing about this is if you upgrade your base layers, let's say we come up with Yella 2.0 based upon all the lessons and experiences and magic we've learned from Yella, you only update the semantics of Yella, and you change nothing else in the system, and you don't have to update any compiler or anything like that. That's the problem with upgrading you know, your base library. Let's say you come up with the new version of Java, Java 9, 
well, then you have to upgrade all the compilers that target that or else they're stuck on the legacy version. Whereas in this system, it just auto updates everything else. So that's really cool. And I, and I think there's uh, some magic there. So that's kind of the second bucket. There's 19 people that are working on that. Some are rebuilding the K framework to make it better based on the 15 years of lessons that RV has learned from it. Some are working on semantic space compilation. Some people are working on Yella. The Yella testnet's actually going to be launching at the end of the month as the first example of it. And some people are working on making K faster, building a K to LLVM backend so that it'll, the machine generated stuff will run basically as fast as handwritten code. The third option is to look at uh, alternative models of computation. So these are things like what Enigma is doing with Intel or what we're doing in our Tokyo Tech Laboratory with multi-party computation. So if you really think about it, a lot of the times you don't particularly care about the blockchain side of the transaction. So for example, you say, well, if I'm playing a poker game, I like the blockchain as a payment system. I like the fact that it can connect me to people. But at the end of the day, I don't really care if my poker game is preserved or not. All I care about is that it's a fair game, people can't cheat, I'm playing against reasonable people, and uh, at the end of the day, I get paid, or my winnings and losses are all balanced. Money going in matches money going out, and it's fair. So why then would you want to do that on a system that gives you all that additional stuff? It says this has to be a game the whole network cares about. It's deeply public, and your computation is competing for everybody else's computation, Furthermore, your settlement time is constrained to the settlement time of the entire network. So if you have 10-minute block times, for example, with Bitcoin, you have to wait 10 minutes for the a state of the game to update. So you have to wait 10 minutes for you to see the next round in the game or something like that. So it's not a, the blockchain model is really bad for those types of applications. And those types of applications turn out to be a large chunk of the applications we tend to care about, not just gambling, but also things like exchange and so forth. Like if you think about a decentralized exchange, do you particularly care that the order book and all of these things are preserved forever and the blockchain and you live within those constraints? No, most people don't. They just say, I want to go from Litecoin to Bitcoin and I want to know I can't be front run and it's a fair marketplace and so forth. So if you use multi-party computation, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You use a blockchain for people to find each other use a blockchain for the exit and entry points of the transaction to be recorded. And then the rest of this stuff happens off chain in its own little protocol. And it just runs until it's terminated. And when it's terminated, people collect their winnings and losses, or in the case of decentralized exchange, you've done a swap. The other advantage is you run at the speed of the participants. And so if you're uh, connecting to high performance nodes, you, you, you could potentially have millisecond latencies as opposed to 10 minute latencies and so forth. And all that computation and all those resources are off chain. Um, but you can still have tunable privacy. You can still do a whole bunch of things like, for example, uh, Kaleidoscope and Royale, two protocols that we've written. Uh, those protocols in no way reveal card information to the other players until you, and you want to do that. So, you know, poker is kind of pointless if people can see your cards unless you show them. Similarly, decentralized exchange, you, there's some, you know, timing behind when you actually enter things into the order book. So we're investigating those options and we're seeing how we can bring those into Cardano. Uh, and there's hundreds of types of MPC protocols we could develop. And the good news is that they actually all share common primitives. And since once we figure out the network side of it and a lot of the cryptographic primitives, these things are composable. And eventually we can actually construct kind of a toolkit for people to build their own MPC type protocols and put them into their dApps. So uh, we've been calling that uh, Lebowski for the moment. And Lebowski is uh, kind of a, a joke about uh, the big Lebowski, you know, where they have the rug that ties the whole room together because this type of layer will kind of tie the blockchain together and give you new capabilities. Uh, so anyway, that's a big effort in 2019. Uh, and we think that's something that's very unique to Cardano. Not many people look into that or have those capabilities. Not only do we have the capabilities, we've already published two peer review papers on those capabilities and we continue to publish them. And at some point we're gonna start dragging those capabilities into Cardano itself. So those are the kind of the three models. Let's be the best accounting model and replicate everything that Wall Street needs. Let's be uh, the best Ethereum model so we can be both interoperable with what Ethereum has done and future proof for everything that people are going to want to do and allow them to write smart contracts in the languages that they care to. And then let's give people new capabilities, whether those be off-chain capabilities like payment channels uh, or those be things, new capabilities like uh, multi-party computation and so forth, which kind of fundamentally change the way that these things work. 
Uh, so that's kind of the computational model of Cardano. So then the next question that we usually get is, well, when is all this going to ship? Now, it is easy to ship an incomplete product, and it is easy to ship something that people can do something with, but not in a very satisfactory way. So if we wanted to, um, after the Yella testnet is complete, um, which would only take a few months, we certainly could have a smart contract layer for Cardano, okay? That layer would be faster and have more capabilities than Ethereum uh, and would certainly have a, a kind of a better development experience because we probably could be more clever about the surface languages that target Yella. Um, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't be revolutionary in that it wouldn't actually give you completely new capabilities like the MPC stuff. So there's always a war as a CEO uh, and as a product manager to decide uh, the balance between revolutionary new things and being able to be pragmatic and give people capabilities that they care about. So uh, we're exploring options about getting smart contracts into Cardano, even if they're not super revolutionary and completely change the world. Uh, but we have to also make sure that we do that in a very safe way. So um, after the yellow test that's had some time to run, we'll take a look at where we're at, take a look at where our sidechains protocols are at, and then we'll make some form of announcement of when we think we can start linking CL and SL together. We already have an Ethereum version of CL running. It's been running for over a month, and the yellow version will be running at the end of this month. So, you know, you, all the things you've come to know and love with Ethereum, you'll be able to do, and then we'll have some new capabilities that we roll out as well. What's really exciting is Plutus and Marlow, because that's a totally new thing. We think people are going to really love that. And our hope is to pull that into SL itself if possible, so that you have the absolute best ledger to issue assets on, uh, if that's your desire. In terms of new capabilities, the way we've built our development model, as they're available, we should be able to roll them into our system in a very organic and natural way. So they don't require massive disruptions or huge hard forks or like huge amounts of planning and so forth. And this system is kind of layered and encapsulated. So even if one of these components was to fail, it wouldn't cascade through the system and cause the system to completely shut down. That's one of the advantages of layering. It's a little bit more expensive uh, in terms of time and architecture, but it certainly does give you a lot more protection than uh, you would otherwise if you had a big monolithic system. So that's the smart contract story. Uh, in short, yes, you'll be able to write smart contracts in more than just Haskell. I would really love to be able to write a JavaScript smart contract at some point. I really would love to be able to write a Java smart contract and a C++ smart contract. And I think that we have a good strategy for bringing these things into our system within a reasonable period of time. Okay. Uh, another one is, what do you think uh, it will for our coin or to decouple Bitcoin? You know, So basically what CryptoKyle is asking is, Will we forever be in a paradigm where Bitcoin and altcoins are linked together? And when Bitcoin goes up, altcoins go up. When Bitcoin goes down, altcoins go down. And, and basically, Bitcoin is leading the pack, and it's completely in charge of, uh, of this stuff. And the reality is that uh, it's like any marketplace. When you first start, there's a leader in that marketplace who sets all those standards in that marketplace. And everybody is just a mirror of that in that they do something more or they do something differently, but you're basically focused on that. Then what ends up happening is that the marketplace grows and then you end up getting diversity within that marketplace. And what happens is that uh, people start caring less and less and less about the leader. If it's IBM with computing hardware, they used to own the entire industry. Now no one really cares. They've left the market. Microsoft with Windows, which used to be a complete monopoly, and everybody had to build their applications a certain way to correspond to their vision. And now more people target Android and iOS than they do Windows, and they don't really even care about Windows anymore. Uh, or Internet Explorer. Now we have a diverse browser ecosystem with Chrome and Mozilla and Safari and so forth. And I imagine that the exact same thing is going to happen. What's going to end up more likely occurring is Bitcoin is going to pull back and, because of its rate of evolution and become a digital commodity. It's gonna become digital gold. And it's gonna be an anchor in the system, a gateway drug into the system with a high degree of liquidity, lots of fiat pairings, good exchange access. And then once you're in Bitcoin, eventually Bitcoin will be capable enough to reasonably communicate with other cryptocurrencies. Maybe this will take three years, maybe it'll take five years, but those bridges will be constructed. And once constructed, we have kind of a web of different cryptocurrencies. 
And there's infrastructural plays, like people who are trying to kill Facebook and replace it with a decentralized version. People are trying to kill Uber and replace it with a decentralized version and so forth. So there's kind of like services. There'll be other digital commodities that have different characteristics about them uh, to compete with Bitcoin. And then you'll have DAP tokens and these things. So there'll be this web of value that happens, a web of blockchains. And these things will look more like the stock market. So they'll all respond to macroeconomic trends. So they'll all go down and up based upon big events that affect the entire industry. Like if there was a huge regulatory change, for example. But other than that, when Microsoft goes up, it doesn't necessarily mean ExxonMobil is going to go up. ExxonMobil can go down, Microsoft goes up. They're loosely correlated. They don't have much connection to each other. That said, there are things that are denser connected, like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Apple. These companies tend to be in the same sectors and compete with each other. So when one goes up, the other ones tend to go up or down. But there's some stronger, tighter correlations between those pairings. And it'll be the exact same thing for cryptocurrencies. You'll have the digital commodity class of cryptocurrencies. They'll probably be clustered with each other. And when Bitcoin goes up, they'll try you know, rising tides. They'll go up. But it will not have as dramatic of effect on infrastructure tokens. For example, if you look at Ethereum and Bitcoin, the coupling over time has already started to naturally decrease. And when Ethereum goes up or down or Bitcoin goes up or down, they don't impact each other as much as you'd think. They still do. Bitcoin's still a Goliath. And Bitcoin usually is the well, the kind of the canary in the coal mine. If it rapidly goes down or rapidly goes up, everything tends to follow it. And that'll probably be the case for some time. But as these markets become more mature, more advanced financial products are created, I do think we'll see some separation. Okay, let's see here. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. Ha, what do you think of LISC since you left your advisor role? Do you think that they solved problems that you thought they were not focusing on? So, you know, I'll probably talk about LISC a little bit. So what happened with LISC is a good friend of mine bought a lot of LISC and uh, he said, hey, I'd love for you to be an advisor of LISC. And I said, well, I don't know too much about the project. And he said, well, uh, let me introduce you to the founders and, you know, let's see if you guys hit it off. So I met Max and Oliver and they're very nice guys and they're uh, very uh, passionate about their product. Uh, they didn't quite have, in my view, all the experience or talent necessary to run a cryptocurrency. If you actually look at a cryptocurrency, it's a very involved affair. Uh, IOHK now has enough capabilities to develop a cryptocurrency, but we now have 160 people with a research division, a uh, full engineering division. There's eight companies working on it. You know, we're in 16 countries. It's it's a lot. So, you know, it's just Max and Oliver. And it's like, okay, you have some money and you have some passion, but you really do need to build a team. So, uh, we talked for a while, and my advice was, well, I could come on as an advisor and um, help you guys, since you now have capital, to basically make some obviously good decisions. For example, you couldn't just have money sitting in a trust or personal account. You needed to put that money in some sort of legal structure that was built in a way to achieve the mission of the people who gave you the money. Like with Ethereum, uh, Vitalik and the rest put the money in the Ethereum Foundation. So similarly, I recommended creating a Swiss foundation. And there's a lot of little advice that I gave like that. But at the end of the day, what ended up happening is about six months into the year that I agreed to help them come on board, I became increasingly frustrated because I felt like things were moving a bit too slowly and that uh, my advice really wasn't being listened to or uh, I should say, even if it was being listened to, wasn't being executed on in a way that made sense. So... That's okay. You know, people have diverging visions, but the thing was that I was consuming money from the list project by being there. And I felt it was morally irresponsible to be an advisor to a project where I was being paid, but not really doing much. So I said, well, I keep what you've paid me. And then for the other six months, you go ahead and keep that and uh, I'll bow out. Now, since I've left, what's happened is the list has grown a lot. They've gotten some great key people, and uh, they've managed to actually do a lot of work. And it's one of the most active blockchain projects now. And uh, I'm very proud that Max has been able to to get himself, it seems, where he needs to be. Uh, and I hope that list can find its own way and really become a great platform for people to use. You know, there was a project that Microsoft released called Project Bletchley, which was kind of like a blockchain as a service project. And there's a litany of things you could imagine, like consensus as a service or storage as a service. And I always felt that that was a good direction for LIST to go into. And it's kind of a direction that EOS uh, has been pursuing. Uh, so 
if they go down that road, I think Lisp will have a lot of utility and value. And because they've chosen a language that is easy to develop in and easy to find developers for, and they got a pretty good foundation to build on, um, I think they can execute very quickly. And um, Lisp can still be quite a valuable project. But ultimately, that's up to Max and Oliver, and uh, they have their vision and may have their work they're doing, and we wish them well. You know, we think that uh, their best days could be ahead of them, and they certainly have the resources to get themselves where they need to go. And that's really the nature of the space. If you look at it at the end of the day, uh, there's more in common between projects than there is uh, in opposition between projects. There are some projects that are very difficult for a variety of reasons for me to, to understand or relate to or interact with. And some of the communities of these projects are extremely negative and toxic and say incredibly hurtful things for sometimes no reason whatsoever. But for the most part, uh, once you separate that drama and the small minority of people that actively seek to be bad actors, uh, for the most part, people like working together or talking together. We talk to the Dash people. Uh, Charlie Lee and I are always having fun on Twitter. Uh, and uh, there's a dozen or so projects that I interact with on pretty much a weekly basis, if anything, just to ask them where the roadmap is at, what's going on. And, you know, IOHK is not just a Cardano company. We're a blockchain company, and we build blockchain technology. We develop protocols. And as a consequence of developing those protocols, we're always thinking carefully about, well, who could benefit the most? Uh, as another example of this, uh, recently I, uh, I tweeted to Justin Sun uh, a recommendation that he use Mantis for Tron. Why? Uh, because I noticed that Justin seems to be using Ethereum Java. And uh, he's made some modifications to it, but it's still basically Ethereum Java. And uh, that code base is not optimal. And if you want to be on the Java virtual machine and use Ethereum, uh, I feel that Mantis would be a, a much, much, much better foundation to build on. And there's a, a lot more innovation that you could do than you could potentially do with Ethereum Java. And there's a lot less risk and danger, given that our code is security audited, um, than the Ethereum Java code base that they're using. Uh, so I made that recommendation. Uh, it's open source technology. There's no partnership. I don't make any money from it. It's just me saying, well, they have a community. If they fail, it's going to hurt a lot of people. Uh, you know, People are going to lose money. So I'd rather see them succeed. And I'd rather see them uh, deliver a great product to market because it ultimately means that the ecosystem as a whole is stronger. And I have a lot of faith in the products that my company builds. So of course, I'm going to recommend those. And it's up to them to decide whether that makes sense or not. If they don't, who cares? It's no skin off my back. We have other uses for Mantis. But if they do, well, then actually it means that it's become a truly open source product that's being used by more than just IOHK and IOHK's affiliates. It's now being used by independent people. We've already seen this happen once before. IOHK invested a lot of time and effort into building up Scorex, and Sasha Ivanov took Scorex and built Waves from it. And Waves has uh, been a very successful product for the position it's in. Uh, we didn't tell him to do that. He just forked the code and did it. And uh, he's actually made some contributions back into the Scorex framework, and we wish them well. So that's how this space works. And I hope that people have a bit more common sense and civility, and they also realize that this is not a sum zero space. The reality is this space is, um, is much more nuanced, and uh, we should focus on the things that hold us together uh, rather than the things that tear us apart. Okay. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to some of the older questions because I've been talking for a long time. Ah, the Bitcoin maximalist uh, question. That's an interesting one. Yeah, so... Uh, I've been in the Bitcoin space as an investor and as a miner and as a person who's been aware of it since um, 2011. Uh, so those were very early days. It was like dollar to four dollar Bitcoin or something like that. And uh, it had already gone through collapse. I think it actually had an all time high, like 30 or something, and then it fell apart. And people said, oh, I guess Bitcoin's dead. And the community was incredibly small. In fact, I, I live in Colorado and uh, I signed up for a meetup group for Bitcoin and I went. There was only two people who registered, myself and someone else. It was at the Gypsy House Cafe in Denver. And I went there and I was the only person who showed up. So that's how small Bitcoin was when I entered. And it was just 
unimaginable for the cryptocurrency space to be where it is at today and have the global scale that it had today. The reality is that uh, th there were kind of two groups of people that were in the cryptocurrency space. There were these computer science-y, open source-y, cypherpunk-y, cryptonomicon uh, guys who they knew about digital money and they liked this idea of open source projects and peer-to-peer -peer protocols. And this was just a cool thing to play around with. And then there was this libertarian gold <coughs> community. And they were, you know, quite complementary in a certain respect. You know, a lot of them on the libertarian side actually came out of the Ron Paul movement where we had kind of lost in 2008 and uh, we were frustrated. So we needed some place to vent. And, you know, this idea of creating our own money and screw the Federal Reserve, that was kind of fun. And if anything, it was a protest. Uh, but no one in either camp had this vision that we would wake up and this thing would be gargantuan. Um, you know, people like to revise history and, you know, reinvent themselves. So there's always, you know, the leaders today is, oh, well, I heard about Bitcoin. I knew it was going to be a trillion dollars and it's going to be a great ecosystem. But um, that, in my experience and in the interactions I had with the big guys then who are still the big guys now, uh, that was not the case. It was, it was a fun thing to do and it was an interesting thing to do. And uh, we, we achieved a lot. I professionally entered the space in 2013, and it was a very different space uh, from 2011. Uh, 2013, we started seeing Bitcoin actually being worth something. It was The ecosystem was worth about a billion dollars. The market cap had really accelerated a lot. There was a ton of interest in it, and people started legitimately talking about Bitcoin businesses. I mean, BitPay was originally set up because the guys who ran it were traders, and they wanted to come up with a scheme to get themselves more Bitcoin because they were long on it. You know, they didn't think too much about, hey, how do we build something to kill PayPal or Visa? They could tell you that, but that's what they started it as. Whereas in 2013, there were really people serious about saying, well, no, we actually think this cryptocurrency thing could change the world. And there were actually billions of dollars of VC capital and private money that entered the space to get it there. Right around that time, I realized that if this was to be a useful ecosystem, we needed to have the ability to represent complex transactions. And we needed to have the ability to represent complex programs. And it's not a new idea. Nick Szabo had it in the 90s. And guys like Sergio Lerner had been working on it in the early 2012, 2013. And Vitalik was working on it. So we posseed up together and created Ethereum. And, uh, you know, obviously Ethereum kind of led the second major wave and also brought the ICO revolution and so forth. Well, here's what happened. Is Ethereum and the ICO revolution changed the narrative and stole the entire spotlight that Bitcoin had. And it was equally likely when you ran into a taxi driver and you were talking about cryptocurrencies that they held Ether, then they held Bitcoin. And a lot of people actually believe that Ether could actually supplant Bitcoin one day. So there was a reaction that, that said, hey, no, Bitcoin is the only thing. Uh, everything else is useless. It's all a scam because of a pre-mine or because of this. And logic just went completely out the door. Uh, and it almost became like a cult. Uh, and unfortunately, because of that, uh, we've seen a lot of the best people leave Bitcoin and go elsewhere, uh, either left the space entirely or they've created altcoins and they've done their own thing and working on their own project. Also, we really just don't see a lot of innovation coming out of Bitcoin these days, which is tragic because there's a lot of great ideas. Simplicity is a great idea. Mast is a great idea. Lightning is a great idea. Sidechains are a great idea. We, we have our own protocols for that, which are awesome. Uh, so these are great ideas, and these ideas really should be adopted. But for whatever reason, they're not adopted, and it's extremely painful to watch something that is so beloved and has so much promise and potential and ought to be Darwinian and competitive hobbled by its inability to make decisions. Um, even small changes like increasing the block size seem to be just beyond uh, the capabilities of that ecosystem at the moment. Uh, they're having a party about the notion of adding snore signatures into Bitcoin. This is a 20-year-old piece of cryptography. Uh, I don't have parties about putting 20-year-old technology into my system. I don't wake up and say, boy, I put PGP into my wallet. Huzzah, look how innovative I am. You know, it's, it's, it's absurd. So I think Bitcoin maximalism is a, a difficult tribal response to either jealousy of the innovation and the narrative that the altcoin space has stolen. And it's also a lot of people being very unreasonable about what it takes to innovate. 
no matter how brilliant a person is, uh, no matter how incredibly well thought out an idea is, it's subject to modification due to the nature of new ideas, new realities, technological improvements. The Wright brothers can be the greatest geniuses in the world, but nobody in their right mind would build a commercial airline off of a Wright brothers plane. And to say that somehow Bitcoin was so magical that it in its original design is going to somehow serve as a global payment system, a global commodity, a global smart contract system uh, is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. It's provably wrong. Furthermore, it is really starting to show its um, vulnerabilities. Recent paper that came out in March of 2018, written at Cornell University, uh, measured the level of decentralization in the Bitcoin network, and it indicated that there are less than 20 major nodes in the system that control 80 to 90 percent of the total hash power, depending upon the range that you look at. That's not a decentralized system. And also the supply chain of these devices necessary to control the system are patented, controlled. Even if you could buy them, you're going to get them much later than the people who make them. Uh, and you're going to be competing with people with subsidized power. Uh, so you can claim that proof of work is somehow a permissionless, decentralized network. But if only a small group of people ever get to play that game and control that game, and they can hold back innovation for profit, uh, you're really not thinking it through. And uh, it's really unfortunate. So unfortunately, I think Bitcoin maximalism is going to continue, but I think its consequences, it's going to make Bitcoin less and less relevant. The market capitalization of Bitcoin will continue to erode or stay stagnant relative to the altcoins. And Bitcoin may even lose the top one slot. And maybe that's going to be psychologically a wake-up call for people to become a bit more aggressive with innovation. Um, the other thing is that you can't have a Bitcoin cash every time you have a disagreement. Uh, it was very painful for the space, and it's uh, caused a lot of uh, emotional harm, and it's been very disenfranchising for a lot of people. Uh, so I would hope that moving forward, they find a way to innovate more. For me, uh, we find our ways to make contributions to Bitcoin where we can, because I still love Bitcoin. I still hold Bitcoin. Uh, we put some money into a paper called Dandelion uh, that was written by a professor named Pramod, amongst others, at University of Illinois. And it looks like uh, Dandelion will be adopted by Bitcoin as a BIP. So indirectly, IWHK has some contribution to Bitcoin Core. And we're glad that to see that there is still some innovation there. We still do learn from ideas that Blockstream has presented. Uh, Russell O'Connor's work on simplicity, for example, was very elegant and really helped us think through some ideas about Plutus. We would hope that the Bitcoin core developers take some of our work more seriously, uh, in particular our work on sidechains, and in particular our work on UTXO wallet design. Uh, unfortunately, that just doesn't seem to be the case. But that is what it is. Uh, so maximalism, in my view, is bad. Maximalism, in my view, will slow down the ecosystem. And in my view, will make Bitcoin much less competitive. Uh, and we live in a Darwinian environment, so it doesn't really matter because that will not slow down the cryptocurrency space, that will not slow down my innovation or Ethereum's innovation or other actors' innovation, and we're just going to keep going until someone gets it done. And if Bitcoin wants to be mosaic, it can be, and it'll certainly be a great historical footnote. If it wants to be Chrome, it can be as well. That's up for the people who guide that ecosystem and for them to make those choices. Uh, but I will remind them that uh, we really can't move is so slow that you're looking like a monopoly. And unfortunately, that seems to be the pace that they're moving at. Okay, let's see here. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Will there be a minimum stake required to register a stake pool in production? Yeah, I've seen this a lot where they say, oh, well, only 100 stake pools can exist or only 100 people can control the network or something. It's it's crazy. Okay, so first, DPoS and Ouroboros does not stand for delegated proof of stake. Some people can't read. I'm not going to mention their names, but they can't read. It stands for dynamic proof of stake. Okay, so what do we mean by this? We mean that in the beginning, you have a distribution. That's the genesis block. So there's a collection of people who own ADA or token and they're percentages. Okay. So if you have 10,000 tokens and Bob has a thousand, Bob owns 10%. That's simple. So when you have a distribution, 
then you can use that distribution as the input into a lottery. And then you can run it, and your chance of winning is proportional to the amount that you have. And then you can populate a collection of people whose responsibility is to run the network. That's step one. Then you have to make a decision of, are you going to actually show up and run the network for your turn? Are you not going to do that? Or are you going to give that right to someone else? Just that simple. And that's where you need a delegation mechanic. Because the reality is that the people who hold the tokens may not necessarily be the people who want to maintain the network. And I'll give you a great succinct example of that. What if you have cold storage? What if you've decided that you want to take your tokens and put them away for 10 years into a mountain in Switzerland? Well, if every time, because you have a large percentage of the tokens, let's say 5% of the network, uh, you know, you, your turn comes up, you'd have to go into the mountain, take it out, make the keys go live and run your blocks. Uh, that's a very unrealistic model. So it'd be nice to be able to say that you have your cake and eat it too, that you can go ahead and put it in the mountain, delegate it to another address, and then have that address, whether you own it and control it or somebody else owns it and control it, run that uh, collection of block creation validation for you. I think that's a fair trade-off profile. Uh, so... Uh, that's level two, is that you need a delegation system. Then level three is, okay, well, once you've constructed that, how do you build a system that's tenable? So you do not want a situation where you have tens of thousands of stake pools. Why? Because you want these stake pools to be 24-7 uptime, super reliable, running relay nodes, providing lots of value to the system. If Dan Larimer's taught the space anything, it's that having a smaller quorum of dedicated nodes is actually pretty good. It gives you much better performance, gives you a much more reliable network topology, and it allows you to start building some meta infrastructure like payment channels and these things, given that these actors exist. But you don't want them to be too few, like Bitcoin, where there's only a small collection of mining pools that exist. So what you can do is you can build a model, and that model can be parameterized in a game theoretic way to kind of converge to what you think is a reasonable set of delegates that if, if people are going to delegate, then the most profitable thing to do is to delegate only to a subset that exists there. Now, they're not pre-selected. They're selected by the community. And anybody in the community can set up their own pools if they want to and market the hell out of them and convince people to join them. But at the end of the day, you need to have that balance between too few and too many. Too many creates performance issues. Too few creates resiliency issues and centralization issues. So you want to have a reasonable set and then you want to have controls where if they don't do their job, there are economic recourses for them to not get paid and thus lose all the stake that's been delegated and lose the brand and reputation that they've constructed. So that's the third layer. And that's what we've written in a paper that's soon to be released about how that model works and how to set those parameters. Now, what's going to happen is that we're going to allow people to register stake pools on blockchain. It's going to be a real easy process to do. Anyone can do it. They pay a transaction fee to register it, but there is no minimum stake required to do it. And then it's just how good of a marketer you are to get people to come on board and run with your pool. Second, we're going to create some form of an image, like a Docker image, that has a basically a default stake pool. And you can just take that and deploy it to Amazon or take that and deploy it to Rackspace and so forth. Uh, and uh, try to run that as a business. And what fees you charge for that pool, so how much the pool gets versus how much do the people who have delegated to it get, uh, is set by you during the registration time. So I think that's a good starting model. Now, of course, can have some issues, and we're going to try to work our way through those, but I think that's the way to get started, to bootstrap the system. And you don't go from nothing to something. What you do is you have a series of iterations that allow you to get there successfully. So what we started, we started stake pool registration through a form. And anybody who was interested, we got collected thousands and thousands of people who were. Uh, we're going to launch a test net at some point soon. And once we launch that test net, it'll have everything set up for stake pools. And then we'll run a subset of them, maybe 100 or 200. And we'll take a look at performance. We'll take a look at reliability and take a look at operational costing and so forth. And then we'll telegraph when the network is going to upgrade to Shelly and have those capabilities. And because some subset of people have already developed experience and skills, uh, we will have a reasonable expectation that when the lever is pulled and the system decentralizes, that there is a reasonable set of people to be there to take it over. Now, uh, when 
you have, let's say, 1% of the system and you want to just do it all yourself, you don't give a shit about anybody else, you don't want to delegate, you can still stake. You have 0.1%. If you want a slot, you can still stake. Those capabilities are built in. It's dynamic in that respect. Ultimately, it's the user's decision whether they want to show up to make the blocks they've been elected to or they want to delegate that to somebody else. That's your decision as the user if elected. And I think that's the fairest way of running the system because what's going to end up happening is you're going to have consensus as a service and you look at stake pools as providing value to the system. And then it's a game of who can provide the most value, which means these pools are competing with each other because it's a race to the bottom just to uh, compete on fees. Uh, and so you know people are always going to be charging less and less. So other people are going to say, hey, I'm going to offer Oracle services and I'm going to offer payment channels and I'm going to offer off-chain computation like uh enabling MPC circuits and these types of things. And so uh, tougher and tougher competition will be more and more services are provided to the ecosystem, which means over time, Cardano gets faster and it gets more capable at a lower cost to everybody in the system. That makes common sense to me. Um, if we get it wrong because we built models first, we can retune the models and we'll, it'll be blatantly obvious that we've got it wrong because we can look at things like, for example, chain quality. We can say, okay, there's 20,600 slots in an epic. How many blocks were actually produced? Were the blocks produced in a reasonable synchronized order or were they coming in asynchronously? Uh, were blocks being properly propagated and transmitted through the system? You know, How long did it take for them to traverse the network diameter? There's hundreds of metrics we can follow and each of those would give us a strong indication of whether the network is healthy or unhealthy. If the parameterization is wrong, then the network will tend towards an unhealthy configuration and state. If the parameterization is right, then the network will be healthy and resilient, and you can perturb it, and it would still be able to, uh, to run effectively. That's how you release a consensus protocol. You do it in layers. You do it in a systematic way. You do it with a lot of telegraphing and a lot of community involvement, and then you get the system out there. Now, over time, the system will scale into other configurations. When we're no longer in a replicated mode, and you are having lots of nodes doing different computations, then it's actually advantageous to have a lot of stake pools because instead of having 100 people do the same thing, you're having 100 people do different things. So it's probably a good idea to have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people involved in the validation and consensus process because it means you're getting amplification as you add new nodes, not replication. That's called Ouroboros Hydra. And it's a research effort that we're right now looking aggressively into from first principles. And as we enter 2019 and 2020, that's going to be the next major configuration of the system. So the goal with Shelly is get stake pools out, get delegation out, get all these rewards out and these types of things, uh, and just get the system decentralized and working and handed to the community. Then the next generation is now how can we leverage the fact that the network has hundreds of thousands to millions of people so that we can have incredible performance, like tens to hundreds of thousands of net transactions per second over an arc of time. Uh, so that's the next big move. It means you have to change your incentive models. It means you have to develop more sophisticated security models. It means that you have to give up the idea that everybody is going to be synchronized with the network and, and have the same view of the state of the network that they'll eventually settle, but some people will see things before other people. And so you have to think very carefully about the security consequences of that. Uh, but we we understand this problem. We understand the trade-off profile of that. Uh, and we have actually one of the best Byzantine researchers around. His name is Matthias Fritz, uh, who's uh, from Switzerland, and he worked at ETH Zurich. And we brought him on board specifically to work on this type of project. And over time, you'll see some papers being published. If you're more curious about trade-off profiles, there's a great paper called OmniLedger, O-M-N-I-L-E-D-G-E-R, which is uh, written out of uh, Trinity College in École Polytechnique uh, Lucerne. And this is uh, a paper that starting point. And we'll do the exact same thing with Ouroboros Hydra. Let's see here. Charles, have you complained to Twitter about the impersonators? I have complained to Jack himself in email format, text message, on Twitter. I complain and I complain and I complain. And I say, Jack, I have nearly 100,000 followers. 
why the hell don't I have a verified status? I will give you a copy of my passport. I will fly to California and go to your house and hand you my passport for you to physically you know, see. Just give me a damn blue badge, ma'am. You gave Justin's son a fucking badge from Tron, for God's sakes. Um, unfortunately, I keep hearing the same answer, which is verification was shut down last year. And as a consequence, uh, you're just going to have to wait for us to turn that back on, and then we'll have a process for it. Um, there are some politics behind verification, not related to our space, more related to left versus right, where certain right-wing people uh, were getting verified. And I guess Twitter was concerned that that looked like an endorsement of alt-right people or something like that. And they got heavy criticism from people on the left. So they decided to do what all companies do when they get heavily criticized for something that doesn't produce value to hide in their shell. So they just shut off verification, said we'll get around to it again. So anyway, the net result of that is that every single time I post a tweet, there are about 10 or 15 bots that post uh, basically tweets on my tweet saying that I'm giving away Ether. I do not own any Ether. I have zero Ether. Historical fact, I've never actually owned Ether my entire life. I was entitled to 293,000 Ether. I didn't take it. I told them, give it to someone else. So I've never owned Ether. I have no Ether to give away. I mean, if you're smart with a bot, maybe you'd say I give away ADA or something, okay? Because the company has some or Ether Classic, but I've never owned Ether in my entire life. I have no Ether to give away for the love of God, you people. But every time I post something, there's 10 to 15 uh, tweets uh, with bots saying, hey, uh, let's go ahead and give you some Ether. Uh, so ignore them. They're not real. They've gotten more sophisticated. Uh, now they're impersonating me on Telegram, uh, messaging people privately, saying we're beta testing a wallet and give us some ADA to test it. Uh, there's, there's never underestimate the cleverness of these people. So just use common sense. I will never ask you to send me money. I have plenty of money. I'm okay. I will never ask you for your private keys and I will never do personal tech support for you or ask you with a personal invitation for a beta test. If I break that rule, I will call you and send you a picture of myself or sign a message with my PGP key. My PGP fingerprint is on my Twitter feed. If at any time you think you're dealing with me and you want to verify who I am, ask me to send over a sound clip, a picture, or a signed message with my PGP key, and I'll be happy to do that. And an impersonator physically cannot do that, so use some common sense. It's incredibly frustrating. Twitter is just a bad platform. It's not innovative. It's old. It really needs a refresh. They need to think more carefully about it. And, you know, Slack has its issues, too. We originally created the uh, Cardano and Ethereum Classic communities in Slack. Uh, we had thousands of members. We ended up abandoning those platforms because we had the exact same issue. People would create bots. Bots would impersonate certain key members and send everybody messages saying, give us ADA or give us Ether, give us your money, use my Ether wallet. That was the big scam. Um, it was not my Ether wallet, it was a fake wallet. And that's just the reality that we live in. It's nothing new. In the 1990s, people from India would call people saying that they're from Microsoft and your computer's about to end and you need to give them your credit card number for them to fix the viruses on your system. They still do this scam 20 years later. Uh, welcome to people who have no life and they want to use their surplus time to steal from you. So anyway, that's what it is. The good news is we have tools to verify ourselves including digital signatures. Craig Wright doesn't apparently know how to use them. I do. So ask me for a signature if you think it's me um, and you're not sure. Okay. Ugh. Cardano debit card. Yay, Cardano debit card. Let's talk about that. Cardano debit card is not an IOHK initiative. It's a Cardano Foundation initiative. Um, what ended up happening was in the early days of Cardano, uh, there was a good commitment that Cardano Foundation got from a firm in Europe to provide debit cards to people. Uh, and they thought that that would be a, a wonderful thing. Uh, but then uh, Visa and MasterCard got much more restricted on the prepaid debit card market and some regulatory changes happened that made these things more difficult. So it delayed the foundation's progress. Uh, occasionally I check in, but uh, the foundation is leading that effort. So we're not involved directly in that. 
I'd love to see one. If one exists, uh, it'd be very easy for us to integrate it into Cardano uh, via Daedalus, uh, just like we're doing a Ledger integration into Daedalus for Ledger. Um, so uh, when those things are available, uh, we'll be happy to work with the foundation to get them integrated into our um, our clients. But at the moment, I don't have any information. Uh, that's a that's a project the foundation's completely in charge of, and we don't tend to get involved in those types of projects. Okay. Do, do, do. Let's see here. Ah, geostamping and the Zien relationship. So let's talk about that. So Zien is an interesting firm. It's led by a guy named uh, Michael Minelli. And uh, Michael uh, is, is, he actually has a Wikipedia page, if you're interested about it. He went to Harvard and London School of Economics. He's a very elegant guy, he lives in London. He's a member of the city of London. And uh, he runs a consultancy that has for more than two decades worked with the banks called Zien. And uh, he's written a lot of great things. In fact, I think, I don't have it here, it looks like. Oh, I have it on my bookshelf outside. Uh, there, he even wrote a wonderful book called The Price of Fish. Smart guy. Uh, so Michael Parsons is a very good friend of Minelli. They've known each other for a long time. And uh, Minelli is always interested in doing research in the cryptocurrency space. And so while IOHK does a lot of hardcore research into things like protocol design and security and ZK snarks and these things, we don't think so much about layer two you know, uses of that technology as much as we should. Like, what are the law and policy implications? Or, um, you know, how, how would you build a geostamping system or these types of things? So the foundation approached uh, Zian to basically write a collection of reports. I think they come out every month or two months. And every one of them is topical, like one's on quantum computing and one's on geostamping and so forth. Uh, and governance. Uh, and each report kind of covers what's going on in space and uh, how, you know, best practices from legacy industries could be used in the blockchain industry for these particular things, or perhaps an innovative new protocol idea. Uh, the hope is that these reports could eventually be turned into uh, layer two, layer three protocols or two dApps that could run on Cardano. And it's a way to kind of dream up um, how do we make Cardano more useful? So all of the reports are open. They're on the ZN website. And I think the foundation also releases them on their website. Uh, and uh, highly encourage reading them. They're usually uh, written by domain experts, and uh, they're pretty comprehensive. They can be anywhere from 10 to 60 pages, and they come out pretty frequently. There's also a collection of events that Distributed Futures has uh, where the foundation shows up, and it's able to network with people in the city of London and network with uh, the broader financial community in the UK, uh, and those events have been tremendously successful and attended by some pretty prominent people from uh, all wakes of life, uh, from politicians to bankers to others. So uh, given its cost and given the output, it's actually, it actually looks like a pretty good program. And it's uh, nice to have these types of things around. It's like a, a little cherry on the top of the cake. Okay. What do you think will be the year of Cardano to replace Ether as smart contract platform and for ICO fundraising? ICOs are going through a slight challenge at the moment in that the art of using an ICO has been perfected. We have the RC20 token. There's dedicated firms that charge you anywhere between 8% to 30% of the offering to basically structure the sale, give you a SAFT agreement, all this stuff. So the act of doing everything that we figured out how to do for Ethereum has been franchise, white labeled, and is a science now. People know how to do it really well. And Ethereum is used as the majority platform because it's the most secure, it's the largest, and it's the best understood, and the best tooling exists there. We get all that tooling for free uh, with the KEVM, so anything that's built for Ethereum runs on our system, but it runs faster, safer, and better. Uh, so if people are just doing an apples to apples, we'd be a great platform for that. But we're entering ICO 2.0, which is the notion of the security token. So what's happening is we're starting to see a crystallization of regulatory understanding of the ICO to the point where regulatory agencies are creating bespoke regulations for ICOs. So what that means is instead of saying, well, we'll get around to it later, later has come and you're either going to be something regulated by the CFTC, if, for example, in the United States, the Commodities Future Trading Commission or the Securities Exchange Commission. 
which is for securities. So whether you're a utility token, which will look like a commodity, or a security token, which looks like a stock or something like that. So what's probably going to end up happening is that uh, people who do ICOs moving in the future will issue a security token, and those will be traded on special domains and have special exemptions, whether it be Reg A through the Jobs Act, Reg D through accredited investors, or Reg S for abroad. And when they're traded, they're traded on regulated exchanges with broker-dealer licenses. And we're starting to see those materialize, like Coinbase and T0 and so forth. Then... If the token has real utility and it actually really does become decentralized and the person who sold it is no longer necessary to maintain it, like what's recently happened with Ethereum, the token may become a non-security. And as a consequence of being a non-security, it would then be regulated by a different agency, in this case, probably the CFTC for the United States. So it could then be traded on the global Bitcoin exchanges that we see like Bitstamp and uh, you know, Bitrix and Binance and the rest of the guys who don't have specialized licenses or are pursuing those licenses. And then you wouldn't need to do all the things you need to do with an IPO or a normal securities offering or any of these normal exemptions. So there's a whole industrial move towards building capabilities to facilitate that security token ecosystem. And some of those are building bespoke smart contracts. Some of those are issuing new types of token standards to go up beyond the ERC-20 uh, some of those are building custodial services and so forth to hold on to things uh, and so forth. Now, when those things eventually materialize and build out, uh, I think Cardano, by nature of its architecture, will probably be a really compelling platform to capture that part of the marketplace. Uh, but it's going to be a huge market, and there's going to be many, many players in that marketplace on both the issuance, uh, the distribution, and the uh, trading of these things. Then when it escapes and it becomes uh, a its own token, I think Cardano will also be a very compelling platform because our counting layer is being built as a multi-asset layer. So it's kept simple on purpose, but it's really, really good to keep your base token uh, uh, basically fast and efficient and not bottlenecked. And then you could use that base token to connect to an overlay protocol. In our architecture, we call it Cardano CL, but using our sidechains protocol, you just as easily can connect that to another overlay protocol. For example, Orbs is deploying as an ERC-20 token on Ethereum, but you don't actually get any utility or use out of that. You have to send it to an overlay system that actually runs its own BFT and it does all the magic and it's doing its own thing. So the cream filling, the magic, all the good stuff happens off-chain or in a different system. And the main chain, because it's secure and reliable, is used for counting, but it's expensive. So on an apples to apples basis, we're going to be cheaper, faster, more secure, better by nature of the way we've designed things. So I think in those use cases, uh, Cardano is very compelling for these tokens to stay resonant there, as opposed to building their own blockchain and trying to construct their own network effect. So I think in both environments, the enclaves that will be constructed for security tokens to facilitate the next generation of ICOs that are better from a regulatory and tax perspective, and from a place for these tokens that are issued to live until they're used to fuel and power their dApps that run as sidechains, uh, both of those marketplaces we're going to be quite competitive with uh, moving into 2019, 2020, as these capabilities start turning on. It's still early days. And um, honestly, uh, what I really despise is this idea of vendor lock-in. I mean, if you look at the days of the internet in the 1990s, <laughs> it, it, it was like you were a web developer. You had to write broken code to work with Internet Explorer. Inter IE6 was such a bad product. And, and you could either say, I'm going to follow CSS standards, or I'm not going to follow CSS standards, but I'm not going to follow it because I, I have to get my website to render on this thing that 90% of the people live on. And then to make matters worse, Microsoft tried to get people into a development paradigm called ActiveX, which was horribly insecure and was very bad for everybody, but it also locked people into Internet Explorer. And now we see companies running around and say, use Ethereum or use EOS or use IOTA or use Cardano. And wait, at the end of the day, if you're a dApp developer, you're not in love with infrastructure. Infrastructure is a service provider to you. It's an enabler for you as a dApp developer to carry out your vision and to maximize the benefit to your customers. If you are told that you now are a slave to the infrastructure that you're locked into, how are we any better? than the closed gardens of Windows and Internet Explorer from the 1990s. We're making, as an industry, the same mistakes again.
So one of the things I really, really, really care about is saying, allow people to treat infrastructure like they treat web services. For example, if you're building an application, you can deploy it on Amazon Web Services or Rackspace or another vendor. And you make that decision based upon what is the best in terms of security and cost and uh, utility to my customers. And if it turns out that you were wrong, you redeploy it on other infrastructure. And that's not as hard as you'd think. Similarly, if you have a smart contract, you have a DAP, you should be able to run that DAP on the best ledger for that DAP. And maybe multiple ledgers because you're doing different things and they're consuming that way. So the whole point of the Daedalus model that we've developed for Cardano is this idea of an application ecosystem and it's blockchain agnostic. So you'll be able to deploy that on Ethereum or deploy that on Cardano. You want to go live in hell, deploy it in EOS. Uh, you can go do that. And that's a decision you make based upon what's best for your customers. And if you make the wrong choice, you should be able to lift up and go into a different ecosystem and it does not compromise your customer experience. Or else what we've done is just created a completely new 1990s scenario. We've created another Microsoft. Congratulations. We're decentralized, but actually centralized. We don't have gatekeepers, but we actually do have gatekeepers. It's not the ethos of the space. It's not what people have signed up for. So to me, I, I think that that's um, a very important point that is often missed. And in the tribalism of the space, and because we sometimes have financial incentives to say things, uh, people say things to try to encourage you to do things that aren't good for your ultimately your goal and your customer base. Okay. Okay, let's see what else here. Who would you rather punch in the face, Dan Lerner or Roger Ver? Well, Roger is actually a pretty cool guy. I've never had a fight with him, and I like Roger. I mean, I, I have disagreements about Bitcoin Cash and other things, mostly about the purpose of it. But at the end of the day, I've never really viewed him as a bad actor. Uh, and it's, you know, a story I often tell about Roger. One time years ago, uh, he said, hey, let me show you something special. And he went to a barber shop, a coffee shop, and a restaurant, all back to back to back. Uh, and in each case, he got them to accept Bitcoin. That's where Roger came from. He's that good. And uh, he's pretty magical in his ability to get people to adopt things. Um, I think that he perhaps hasn't fully thought out the consequences of Bitcoin Cash or um, the consequences of the ecosystem he's built. And also, it's incredibly regrettable that he's working with or associating with Craig Wright, who I believe is a sociopath. He's a bad actor. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't have any issue with Roger. The other thing is Roger is really good at martial arts and he can kick my ass. So I really want, want to punch that guy in the face. As for Dan Larimer, Dan is Dan. So uh, let's see what else we have here. What will happen to Emergo, IOHK contract for developing Cardano? Uh, by 2020, we will have a uh, by 2020, we will have a, a fully operational treasury that'll, and I'll stick around until that's done. Uh, so if it bleeds into 2021, we'll keep working until that's done. And at that point, there's going to be specifications, a Cardano improvement proposal process, competing clients written in different languages by different development teams. It'll be a very decentralized ecosystem. And uh, IOHK would love to continue doing research and engineering, but you, the ADA holders, will be able to make that choice. So uh, we'll submit a funding proposal to keep the contract going, uh, but you get to decide whether that happens. And that's how it should be. At the end of the day, engineers work for you, the owners of the protocol. And if it's truly a decentralized protocol, the holders of ADA own that protocol. So they ultimately should make the decision of who are the best teams to carry that protocol forward. Furthermore, you need more than one because you achieve diversity and resilience by having more than one. You know, you don't want a situation where you have key man risk, where if someone gets hit by a bus, someone gets compromised, someone decides to start eating mercury on a regular basis and goes insane. Uh, that just makes no sense uh, because if that occurs, you all of a sudden have lost your protocol. So, uh, so it's very important that the community have the tools and the capital to be able to make sure that there's diversity in the development and the, the thought and position and a very strong foundation to get performance, to, to get all these layer two technologies where they need to go. 
And then finally, to get all the governance and the other components put into the system. Some of these can be done in parallel. Some of them require some sequential work. Some is incredibly difficult research. Other is just an engineering problem where we have to think carefully, like with the UTXO wallet, about how we want to do it and why we're doing that and so forth. So that's what's going to happen. We're still going to be around and we're going to be asking for additional funding. But um, you, it's usually easier to do this when you have two people because one guy follows the questions and then picks out some. So there's a continuous flow. Next time I should probably do that. All right. Well, anyway, Japanese exchanges does come up a lot. Um, you know, Japan is a frustrating market. I've been there a lot. I actually spoke with some of the ministries. I spoke to Medi and uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs last time I was there. And we'll just keep talking to them. Um, in the early days, there was no regulation. You just do whatever the hell you wanted to do. And obviously, that created a lot of big problems. Um, and people got a bit too aggressive and ambitious. So what ended up happening is that... Um, they decided to regulate the market and they passed a very aggressive law to regulate the exchanges. Implicit in that was also a notion of um, restrictions and token listings. Uh, so basically they said, not only are we going to tell the exchanges how to operate for the best interest of the people, we're also going to tell the exchanges what tokens they can trade. Um, that's fine because then you have some rules to follow and you go follow them and you try to convince people that you're good. Uh, but the problem is it's never actually been clear what the standards are to be listed on exchanges. And at the moment, there's actually delistings happening. Privacy coins, for example, are not faring so well in Japan. Um, at some point, uh, Japanese exchanges and the FSA, the regulatory body that's responsible for this, will reach some sort of broker compromise about how listings are going to occur. And at that point, I think ADA will fare very well because on every single metric, uh, we look good. Uh, there's tons of transparency and credibility in the project. The technology is world-class. We have independent auditing. There's oversight in the project. Use of funds is extremely reasonable uh, and very transparent. Uh, there's a huge public team that has a multi-year commitment. It's extremely hard to find uh, anything that has an equivalent level of commitment to producing value as our team. There's certainly a lot of people doing interesting things, but at the end of the day, I think we're the best. A little biased, but at the end of the day, I do think we're the best. We also uh, have a strong ties to Japan. We have a research lab at Tokyo Institute of Tech. A lot of people in Japan love ADA, and it would be fundamentally unfair for the Japanese government to tell them that the only way they can trade ADA is to go abroad to exchanges Japan cannot regulate because they're abroad. Uh, so uh, I think that we'll fare well. It's just unfortunately because of the coin check incident because of the multiple SROs, because of ambiguity in the law and regulatory uncertainty, uh, people are following a very conservative approach. And there really isn't a financial incentive or a rush for the FSA to move quickly. They're going to move in a very systematic and methodical way uh, and decide what's best for them and for the people of Japan. My hope is that at the end of the day, uh, we fare well, but we'll find out. And um, we'll do our best to, to try to convince people in that jurisdiction that uh, ADA should be part of the marketplace. It would be extremely unfortunate uh, to just have Ripple, Ether, and Bitcoin because those are safe tokens for whatever the hell the reason. Um, but we might end up in that reality, uh, or we might end up in a reality where Japan is a world leader, which lists hundreds of tokens and has tons of innovative projects. Uh, the jury's out on which side is going to, um, to happen, and we'll let you know as we learn. What do you think of Jackson Palmer, creator of Dogecoin, and skepticism of Cardano when he said in a video that your white paper was a lot of fluff? Which part? The proofs? The many papers? The peer review process, which is all public? Uh, the the fact that we actually bothered to, to build real security models and actually think of things in very foundational ways? I mean, forgive me, I'm I'm not so good at taking a Shiba Inu and building an entire ecosystem around that. Um, you know, cryptographers are cryptographers and engineers are engineers and marketers are marketers and they all do different things. The point of the foundations of Cardano was to go to the most qualified people we could find in the world and get them to care about solving the problems we need to solve for Cardano to be stable and reliable. That doesn't port into 
solving every single problem all at once. It means you have to follow a process. It means you have to define basic things like what is a blockchain? What is proof of stake? Can it ever even be secure under even unrealistic assumptions? And then if you're going to make those assumptions realistic, what do you give up in that process? And can you still preserve your security model as you do that? We have invested over $2.24 million, written five papers in three years on just the Ouroboros thread. And we've involved ourselves with institutions, uh, eight, I think eight different universities at this point, people who are at those universities. We've gone to EuroCrypt, to Crypto, and EuroCrypt again. And we'll be at other conferences soon showing off this technology. And we're only about halfway through the research thread. So when I read things like he said, well, there's just a lot of fluff in that paper. First, I'd like to ask him, does he actually even understand what the hell is in the paper? Because it wasn't written for him. It was written for academics. Second, did he even bother to take a look at the other things that we've done? Like, for example, does he know how to build a UTXO wallet? Well, he forked Bitcoin. Satoshi came up with that, did he? Well, we didn't know how to build one, so we figured it out, and we wrote a formal specification for those things. And that's what we do on the engineering side. And that specification is so involved, it took Sebastian two hours to just do an overview of it. And it's a beautiful piece of work. And that's how we operate. We're just walking our way through the space, finding the problems that we need to solve and getting the right people onto those problems and solving them in the most rigorous academic engineering uh, smart way possible. And we write paper after paper after paper. And not every paper solves every problem and not every paper is useful for every context. But once we've solved something and we're confident about that, that's granite. It's bedrock. And we're starting to really see great fruits being produced. At this point, we're very confident that Ouroboros Genesis is a wonderful consensus algorithm to run a cryptocurrency with. And once you'll see our delegation and our incentives paper, these three things together are everything that you would need to run something much better than Bitcoin, much more performant than Bitcoin, and it doesn't cost billions of dollars a year to run. Furthermore, we're very confident in the code we've written, very confident in the designs that we've come up with. And we know where the deficits are. We know where the bodies are buried. And we know how to exhume them and put them in their proper places. And we have a process for that. And every single day, we tirelessly work towards that process. We keep innovating. We keep growing. We keep bringing people in. We went from two people to 160 people, many of which hold PhDs, many of which have strong professional reputations and have published hundreds of papers. The programming language we're writing this in, the guy who created the programming language works for us. And we're a lot of fluff. And this is what I was talking about earlier about the tribalism and the noise and the vitriol in the space. People see something and they say, this doesn't immediately solve all my problems. This doesn't immediately make everything great. This hasn't somehow been so magical that it invalidates every other project. And therefore, it's fluff. <laughs> yeah, and to me, that's just absurd. You know, the point is we're rebuilding the entire world financial system. The one we have was not created overnight. We inherited that system that was meticulously constructed decade by decade by decade by decade by people who came before us. It is beyond arrogant to say that we can come in and rebuild this entire system in a single fucking paper with a single fucking code base. It's just, it's just so insane. What you do instead is you construct a process that is scalable, that is capable of welcoming new people in from different wakes of life, different skill sets, different cultures, different languages, that is capable of identifying the problems you need to solve to have a better system coming up with reliable solutions for those problems, and then having a feedback mechanism to verify that those solutions work and are proper. And then once you've done that, you've made progress. And you do it again and again and again. It's like the scientific method. Everything we have in life that's good has come from the ability to make mankind stateful, to preserve what we've come up with, and to be able to change things that we don't like instead of having to accept the status quo. And cryptocurrencies are no different at all. So I like our progress. I like our process. 
I like the things we've accomplished. I think that a lot of people are really starting to understand that this is a much bigger and more ambitious project than they originally intended. And they're starting to realize that we have an incredibly strong commitment to doing things in a smart way. The other thing is this is not an IOHK project. This is a collective project. Predictable Network Solutions works on this. Twig works on this. FP Complete works on this. WellType works on this. Allied Testing works on this. Qvic works on this. Runtime Verification works on this. Emergo works on this. The Cardano Foundation works on this. ATIX works on this, amongst others. And that's where we're at today. The processes that we have will continue to scale. And one day we will have hundreds and then thousands of companies unified by peer review, formal methods, and a very systematic, rigorous way of going about things, and eventually a decentralized form of governance. It will take decades for us to perfect it and for the system to work well, but it's the perfect system to build the world's next financial stack. That's the point. That's why we've invested so much time and effort into all of these things. So um, with all due respect, uh, that's what we're doing. If you don't like it, there are many other options on the marketplace that are better suited for you. If you do like it, welcome aboard, grab a shovel. African countries. Oh, this is near, near to my heart. So I, I went to Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa, and I went to uh, Kigali in Rwanda. And boy, we had a great time. Uh, we, really enjoyed, uh, we really enjoyed talking to a lot of really interesting people. Uh, and I learned a lot. You know, uh, For example, going to Ethiopia to Addis Ababa, I didn't realize that the coffee industry there is like as close to Game of Thrones as you can get. Um, and you have to be really careful with who you talk to and who you take pictures with and so forth, because it's almost like House Targaryen and House Lannister and House Stark and so forth. And I was like, whoa, okay. Um, but uh, it's very old industry. It's very um, prominent industry. And it controls basically a large chunk of the country's economy. About a million and a half farmers do nothing but coffee production. Um, so we had a lot of great discussions with the Ministry of Science and Tech, and we had a lot of great discussions with leaders, including the World Bank and others who were embedded in Ethiopia, about what would be low-hanging fruit for us to actually get a uh, high-impact, low-resource pilots that we could run showcasing the value of blockchain technology, some of which could run on a permissionless ledger like Cardano, and some of which could run on a permission ledger like things like Hyperledger Fabric or Enterprise Cardano and so forth. So in Ethiopia, uh, basically, we agreed to host a class like we did in Barbados and Athens and have that class uh, basically uh, invite recent graduates from Ethiopian universities to uh, sit down for two months and to learn lots about how to write code in Haskell. And then if they're really good, we'll offer them a job at IOHK and then we'll put them onto blockchain projects, either permissioned or permissionless. The ministry was very progressive. They said not only did they want to do this class, uh, they wanted it to actually be all women, which you said, okay, um, that's interesting. Let's go do it. Uh, so we, uh, we agreed, uh, as, assuming that they can source the candidates, and uh, we're already starting to send uh, personnel from abroad into Ethiopia to begin preparations for that class. Um, it looks like the soonest we'll be able to run it will be October, and it'll probably run to the end of the year. Uh, we're going to incorporate a local subsidiary in Ethiopia, in Addis, and uh, on the backs of the course, uh, the really good ones will hire, and uh, that team will work on blockchain-based projects. Uh, we'll probably do a pilot with that team in uh, something involving supply chain management with coffee production. It's a great, really low-hanging fruit, amazing industry to think about, and there's a lot of return there which could uh, touch pretty much everything from microinsurance to microfinance to a lot of agri-tech revolutions, uh, some IoT stuff, some AI stuff, uh, and so forth. Uh, so that's going to be a fun jurisdiction to play in, and we have some great partners on the ground, and uh, John O'Connor will make some community updates at some point about progress that's been made. He's our director of African operations, and he's embedded in Ethiopia and lives in Audis three weeks uh, every month and goes back to London for a week. He has family in both places. In terms of Rwanda, I went there for Vision Africa, and uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, Kigami and um, other people. Uh, it was a very interesting conference. We, uh, we met a lot of really unique people. I think there were leaders from over 10 or 15 African countries there. Uh, and uh, we got a sense that Rwanda is the fastest moving of all the African countries in terms of its agility and ability to adopt new ideas. It's almost like the Singapore of Africa. Uh, that said, it's a very small jurisdiction and a very small population relative to Ethiopia. Ethiopia has about 100 million people. 
the AU is there. It's it's got strong trading partnerships with Kenya, Nigeria, and other large jurisdictions, and much larger economy relative. So um, Rwanda really looks like a good place to do fast pilots and uh, basically get all the kinks and bugs worked out and get them localized and acceptable. Whereas Ethiopia looks like a larger growth market, as does Nigeria and Kenya. So both of them have their place and purpose, and we'll probably be running things in both jurisdictions and we'll make specific announcements. And these aren't the only two African countries we'll be in. Uh, Kenya is probably the furthest along in terms of blockchain tech, and there's some good entrepreneurs there like BitPesa. Uh, Nigeria also has probably one of the largest IT groups of people in Lagos. So uh, we'll definitely drop by there and have some fun. But uh, Africa is very important to IOHK, and we're going to be really scaling up African operations. But um, my number one priority is getting Cardano to a better state. So um, that takes priority and precedent over our evolution in the African market. But long term, I think that's the place where Cardano really has a chance to shine because we can show off a lot of cool tech like offline off-chain payments using trusted hardware. Uh, that's where these things like these private NPCs make a lot more sense. Um, it also gives us a chance to start exploring ancillary technology like incentivized mesh nets. We even published a paper on that called Mars. Um, so that's, uh, that's something I'd highly recommend you read. It was, came from Bernardo David. So uh, we're definitely going to push hard in that jurisdiction and we're definitely going to you know, have a lot of fun in it. But it is something that we have to enter in cautiously and systematically. And it's probably going to take about three to five years to build up reasonable presence. So a lot of the output and returns will not occur until about 2022, 2025, I'd say, in that range. But that's okay. You know, you have to be humble and you have to listen and you have to grow. Cardano ATMs. So ATMs in general, pretty cool space. Um, so there's a lot of software that has to be written to make ATMs viable. You need to have a good server client model. And we were really, really hindered because we made some poor choices in the beginning of Cardano. And one of the vendors that we worked with made some incredibly poor design choices that were almost recovered from, but um, have really slowed things down. But we kind of built a parallel track of code and we've written out a Rust library and uh, we've, uh, I can't spoil the surprise, but come August, there's going to be something announced that's awesome for the light client, the mobile client and the ATM type client. Uh, so uh, look out for that. Um, in terms of Cardano ATMs in Japan, there was a third party partner uh, that uh, that was keen on doing that, and they wanted to deploy 50 ATMs prior to 2020, and they've already deployed some Bitcoin ATMs in the jurisdiction. Um, and we uh, answered a lot of technical questions about how to support Cardano and gave recommendations about the architecture, uh, but we don't physically own those devices, and we don't operate them. Uh, so we're not sure uh, how they've been deployed and when and if ADA support is going to be turned on, uh, but it would be nice to see. Uh, that said, we're really keen to investigate uh, an open source ATM design for Africa. And we think that there's a lot of innovation that can happen there to create a low cost ATM in the two to $500 uh, price range. Because if you're talking about cryptocurrency adoption amongst the people who don't have it, um, they need a cash in cash out point. So yes, you can send Bitcoin or ADA or Ether to a maid from a maid in London to her mother in Manila well, what is the mother going to do with it? She needs a point to exchange it and sell it. And if that exchange point takes a 20 or 30% premium, then you're no better than a remittance transaction. In fact, you're worse because you're actually uh, dealing with a more exotic, more volatile asset with less liquidity than she would get if she got a Western Union transaction. So if you had ATMs uh, and these were reasonably well proliferated and they were run by uh, independent merchants, the fees would probably converge to three to five percent over a period of time, which is much better than the 15 percent remittance side of things. So we do have a trusted hardware lab that we're building at uh, the BTL, the Blockchain Technology Lab up at University of Edinburgh. It's led by Vasily Zikas, and there's some joint funding from Huawei in that lab. And part of the things that lab is going to be looking into longer term are open source hardware solutions, both on the trusted hardware side and also for things like ATMs and key management. Uh, so we'll create a reference design for that at some point, and uh, our hope is to see people build that. By the way, it's if you have a two hundred to five hundred dollar price point, it's actually not hard to build two or three thousand of these and just give them away to small business owners. The harder part is understanding: can you get them to operate off grid? Like, um, how much would it cost for a satellite uplink, and could you use microsatellites or mesh nets to be able to uh, piggyback onto the main network? 
And if there's a trusted hardware component, even if they're asynchronous, when they do reconnect, you can get reliably honest information, assuming there's some finality in the chain. So there's still a lot of technological challenges there, but I do think we can overcome those particular challenges. Another big thing in Africa is it's an old saying, batteries tend to grow legs and walk away. And um, ATMs are no different. Satellite transceivers are no different. So, uh, so you also have to think very carefully about where the deployment targets are. Now, specifically for Japan, uh, that was done by a third party, and uh, I don't follow that too closely. I know some of my crew have seen the ATMs that are supposed to have for ADA support, uh, but uh, I, I haven't personally used them myself, so I couldn't, um, couldn't let you know. The debit card ATM stuff, that's infrastructure separate from the things IOHK works on or thinks about. <sighs> Win Lambo. You know, I always wonder, why Lamborghini? You know, I drive a Cadillac. I have an XTS, a 2014 XTS. It's a great car. Got it for like $25,000. Highly recommend it. It's got magnetic uh, suspension system. It's got great brakes. Leather all throughout the seat. Uh, it's got a Bose sound system in it. It's like 22 speakers. And he's talking about Lamborghini, you know, it's $200,000 for a uh, Huracan or, you know, a Giardo is about 100000 to 150000 You know, your Aventador is probably 300 k or more. And uh, Murchalago is like two fifty. And then at the end of the day, you have a car that you're not going to drive more than 1,000 miles a year that collects dust and it costs you $5,000 to change the oil. And if your brakes go bad, those Brembro brakes are like twenty five grand. So... You know, why, why, why Lambo? Why not something else? And if you're going to get a high performance sports car, then why not something interesting like a Ford GT or a Camaro, you know, buy American. There's some good cars there. Have you seen the Corvettes lately? Come on, guys. When Cadillac CT6, the new 2019 CT6, 550 horsepower twin turbo V8. And those turbos are right in the engine. There's no lag with them and a 10 speed transmission thinking man's car. Okay. Uh, in Indonesia and Amergo. Um, Amergo has a lot of great partnerships. They're based in Singapore and Hong Kong, and they have offices in Japan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, uh, Viet and a few other places. Uh, so uh, they make great partnerships all around, and where and when we can work with them, we do. Um, they're really keen to do something in Taiwan, and they're really keen to do something in both Malaysia and Indonesia. And they already have some great contacts there. And what's exciting is these are incredibly high population jurisdictions that are very malleable. Uh, Indonesia is several hundred million people. I used to live in Jakarta. Uh, Malaysia is also in the same uh, population density. And these are remittance countries. So there's a ton of innovation that you'd like to do on the payment system side and on the lending and in the insurance side in particular. There's also big agricultural uh, side. So all the agrotech work that we're doing in Ethiopia could potentially be ported there. Um, so I think Amergo is very prescient in building good relationships in those jurisdictions. And what we do is we talk about, well, capabilities and we ask them, what capabilities do you guys need and what capabilities are we constructing? And it helps us inform the roadmap so that we can better address those capabilities moving forward. Um, but you'll have to address those questions specifically to Amergo about the particulars of the strategy. Craig Wright. <laughs> guys want me to talk about Craig Wright? Are we going to go down that road? Siren Labs, partnership there is going uh, quite well. Actually, I talked to them when I was in Japan. Uh, their guys have already started talking about integration into the Finney uh, for uh, Cardano. I actually saw one of the Finneys. They brought a sample from their labs in Israel to Japan. And it's really cool. It's a cell phone, and it actually has a trusted hardware module here that you slide up. And so when you're doing things, you push a button on it to authorize a transaction. It's almost like having a ledger plugged into your phone. Uh, so it, it will natively support ADA. And we're just trying to figure out what's the best way of doing that. Right now, our hope is to reuse everything that we've constructed for ledger support and put it in for the uh, for the Finney. But there's some architectural things we have to think really carefully about with them. So we are actively discussing that with their engineers. But once it's all said and done, uh, you guys can get a Finney, and that Finney can be used to store your ADA in a very secure way. So you can write your recovery words and put them in a vault somewhere, like a safety deposit box, and you can have it on your phone. And if you ever lose the phone, you can always restore it. Uh, and otherwise, you have a really easy mobile light wallet uh, to be able to keep things. 
Uh, so, uh, so we'll keep you advised on that one. I think the Finney release date is October. Given the nature of their cycles, what will likely happen is they'll do a firmware update to the TPM to support ADA because we probably won't make the October launch on that, but we might. Um, Ledger support should be coming out right around that time, around with Cardano 1.4. And if we can reuse a lot of that infrastructure, it might be uh, optimal. I suspect what they're going to do is run the Rust code on their um, on their module, not the Haskell code. So we'll find out more about that as um, time permits, but uh, we'll we'll keep you updated. Trip to Israel. You know, Israel's great. Um, we went there for Eurocrypt, and Eurocrypt is just fun. And it's actually, I think, the first time Eurocrypt has ever been held at Israel. It was quite controversial uh, because the Iranian cryptographers couldn't make it there. Uh, but uh, I also had a chance to visit Moshi and his guys. Uh, and uh, I met with the Saren Labs people, the Saga people, the Orbs people, the Endor people. There's some good projects and the interesting projects. Um, and uh, what amazed me is, is the ability to innovate without having to spend a lot. So while some of these projects are well capitalized, uh, they're not actually expending a huge amount of money to execute. And they have some very good talent. Um, and so uh, Israel is, as it's always been, it's a huge innovation hub. It's basically a, an oasis in the desert because of the hard work of the people who live there. Uh, and uh, the fact that we're in a new industry, the cryptocurrency industry, in no way changes the, the commitment they have. Say so what you will about the politics. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an innovation spot and will continue to be an innovation spot. Uh, so uh, a lot of people there were hungry. Uh, they have a very strong commitment. Uh, to doing interesting things, and they really want to partner with everybody, especially if those partnerships produce value. So in a way, that was incredibly uh, fun because I, I sometimes have challenges partnering with people uh, for whatever political reasons, or in some cases, like CoinDesk, uh, people go out of their way to just be dicks. And so, um, so it was nice to go to a place where people cared about the work and people cared about executing the roadmap and realize that you have to have strategic partners to be able to do that. So Israel was quite successful and we'll go back from time to time. The other nice thing about Israelis is they're willing to travel. So you don't even have to go to Israel. They'll come to you. Like I met with the Syrian guys in Japan, for example. You know, Tezos is a really interesting, uh, a really, really, really interesting project. Uh, you know, it's one of those examples of where you have great people in a certain domain. In this case, Arthur, he's a very good engineer and he's a very bright guy. And they don't actually know the other side very well at all. They don't actually understand the business side or open source development, uh, but they think that that's easy. So what they do is they structure something as an engineer would, and then they say, oh, okay, well, uh, company here, company here, company here, raise all this money, get all these partners and capital pools here, some goes here, some goes here, and it's a system, right? So if the system is all put together and these things are done, huzzah, you know, it all just works. And then they say, well, what about people? Oh, who cares about people? People are fungible. So just put whoever here and put whoever here and... We don't really need real people. We'll just hire them, you know, whenever we need to hire 10 people here, hire 10 people there. And that's what they did. They put very bad people in key roles and uh, they structured something that seemed from the outside to me to be designed to minimize liability at the expense of consumer protections and ability to execute. Okay. Uh, and they paid a terrible, terrible price for that in that the people that they put into key positions were not vetted properly and not given the right controls and checks and balances to be able to execute or wash out. So the project went through a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. Uh, and this is really unfortunate because Tezos actually is doing some interesting things. Mickelson and liquidity are very interesting. Uh, the use of Alchemel is actually a very interesting choice and there's a lot of innovation that can come. They're starting to partner with the right people. Um, and if left to their own devices, and you said all the drama of the sale, the size of the offering, the incentives behind the offering, and if you were just to do an airdrop of Bitcoin and say, this is Tezos, I think a lot of people would, would look at the project very positively, and they would say that there's a lot of really interesting things here. But unfortunately, you cannot look at these projects in isolation. You have to look at them with respect to everything that's happened, and then the ecosystem upon which the projects lived in. And 
projects like Tezos, EOS, and others all suffer from the same common sin, which is they raise too much money. You do not need $200 million to build a cryptocurrency. Even something as sanely complicated as Cardano, you do not need this kind of money. You do not need a billion-dollar DAP fund or VC. You don't need any of these things. It's absurd. Uh, if you look at some of the best venture capitalists in the world, like John Doerr, 192 IPOs, invested in Google, invested in Intel, uh, the guy is is just walks on water. He's a genius, and he's he's really one of the best. If you came to him and said, for a completely new ecosystem that's very fragile, very young, completely new project, uh, we're going to put $4 billion in it. Would you like a billion dollars to go run a venture fund for that? He would look at you like you're a green-eyed monster. Because at the end of the day, he knows that there's no responsible way to be able to invest that money, and all you'd be doing is just distorting salaries. I mean, there were people who went to John, like Steve Jobs. He went to John and said, I'm creating the iPhone. We're going to have applications on it. I'd like some venture capital to exist for people to build cell phone apps. This is a very new concept. They didn't put a billion dollars into it. And this was Apple and Steve Jobs and the iPhone, Okay. And there's a track record there, and there's definitely a mass market, whereas EOS and Tezos are much, much smaller. So the first common sense, I think, is they were overfunded. And um, as a consequence of the overfunding, people don't talk about the technology, the vision, the mission, the goals, the dreams, like we did with Bitcoin, because there was no money in the beginning with Bitcoin. The only thing we had was dreams and a mission. They talk about, how do I get my hands on a chunk of that massive amount of money that's just sitting there? The second original thing is that somewhere along the way, you have to learn that you're not the smartest person in the room. You're not brilliant. You have to listen to people. My company is filled with people much smarter than me and much more capable than me. And I love that because I can learn from them and because I can trust them to do things I could never do throughout my career. Maybe one day, if I spent 10 years, I'd be a decent cryptographer. I'd be a decent one, not a good one. And I have people in my company who are exceptional ones, who have spent 20 years at that. So why in God's name don't you just give that stuff to them and let them do their job? And then you can negotiate how that's going to benefit the ecosystem as a whole. One of the problems that I've always had with Tezos in interacting with Arthur and his team has been that I feel like they just think that they know the whole world and they have it all figured out. No matter what advice you give them, doesn't matter. It's talking to a wall. They've figured it out. And it's the same for Dan Larimer, and it's the same for a lot of these guys like Craig Wright. They all seem to be cut from a common cloth of, we know more than everybody else, and we know the future, and you're just going to sit back and watch us give you the future. Steve Jobs thought he knew the future, and he was fired from Apple. He thought he knew the future with Lisa. He thought he knew the future with Next Computers. And every single time he released these things, they were always too late, too expensive, and they really weren't what they promised to be. And it was only after he worked with John Lasseter and the guys from Pixar, and he just kind of got his ass reamed to him for 10 years, that he actually learned the value of listening and learning. And when he started doing that, he was able to do some very amazing things. Like when he came back to Apple in 1997, it was dying. They were literally months away from bankruptcy. Uh, and he had to do something that Steve Jobs in his 20s could never do. He had to call up Bill Gates and make a deal with him and convince him to put millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into Apple to keep it alive. He had to make Internet Explorer the default browser for Apple. He had to have Bill Gates appear on a stage behind him on a giant screen talking over him like Bill's one. Uh, but he had to do that because he knew that was the only way to save the company. And it was the only thing he could do to give him the moral authority to go and renegotiate lots of employment contracts. It was not easy in 1997 at the height of the, you know, the, big, the frothing of the dot-com boom to keep your employees. Imagine when you have a guy at your company who's a world-class engineer and you're paying him $120,000 a year because you've cut his salary eight times and his stock options are worthless, having a friend in the Valley say that he can make $400,000 plus options to go to that guy and tell him he has to take another pay cut. And that's what Steve did. And he did it successfully, and now Apple's what it is today. And he did that because he had humility and the ability to listen, and he created moral authority. Uh, that's missing in a lot of these projects. 
It, they're all incentivized by the wrong things, and they've built very strong cults of personality around them. Um, if you want to see what true humility is, just go to YouTube and enter in Steve Jobs, Apple, uh, 1997, Bill Gates, or some search parameter like that, and watch the video. You'll see Bill behind him. You'll see Steve getting booed on a stage by his own people, but he knew that's what, what needed to be done. Uh, and I just don't see that from a lot of projects because a lot of projects at the end of the day aren't about innovation. They're not about changing things. They're about how do we make people as rich as possible? And if the success factor of a project is you participated in the ICO and you've managed to find an idiot to buy the tokens from you at a multiple of what you paid for, it, so you got yours, we are no better as an ecosystem and no better as a community than the people that we seek to replace. We have people who do this every day. They're called Goldman Sachs. If you read the emails between the traders who sold junk financial products to people before the 2008 collapse, uh, and you see how they said, well, it's junk, but I managed to sell it. How are we morally any better if we do as a space the same thing? And unfortunately, I see that in a lot of projects. Um, so I think that needs to change. I think we need to be more humble. I think we need to listen to people. And I think we need to be a bit more careful with our words and uh, a bit more careful with our judgments. At the end of the day, you're not always going to agree with people. And at the end of the day, you're not always going to like people. But you have to work with them and you have to find some way to respect them. Uh, I don't always agree with Vitalik, but I've never had a bad conversation with him. And I do respect him. He's a good guy at the end of the day, and he does good work. And I will never in my life ever say that he doesn't care about Ethereum or the mission of Ethereum or the goals of Ethereum. We strongly disagree on the DAO hack. And we strongly disagree about a lot of the things that have happened. But it's water under the bridge. It happened. We went our own way. But I respect him as a person, and I respect his leadership, and I respect that he makes good decisions sometimes bad decisions, but at least he's making decisions with humility and an open heart. I cannot say the same about certain other people in the space. And um, I hope we as a space grow up a little bit and we realize that we only have a small window of time to actually affect and make real change. And we only have a small window of time to prove ourselves to be better than those who came before us. If we squander that window, Yes, we'll get rich, and some of us already have gotten rich, and we may even be able to keep the wealth that we've made, but we haven't improved the world, and all we've done is given the very people that we sought to replace better tools to make our lives more miserable, better tools to freeze our assets, better tools to enforce civil asset forfeiture, better tools to track every purchase that we've made, better tools to compromise our privacy and reduce us all to a big data problem that AI can parse and decide who's good and who's bad. That's all we've accomplished. So yeah, congratulations, you get a Lambo, but you've traded your soul for it and everyone else's future for it. So with respect to these types of projects, I would hope that they realize that they have a tremendous social responsibility. They have a tremendous obligation to the space. And when you're given that much capital, you must invest it wisely and you must have humility. It will run out one day uh, and, um, you have to be accountable for how you spend it.